Friends, I am extremely happy to have with us to welcome Professor Tatan Parikh, a dear old friend. Many years ago, when he was in town doing his PhD, he hosted him at Trusty and uh, he was at the institute uh, doing research on building databases for innovation, how to share them, how to make them open access. He has got so many awards, I don't want to burden you with a list of them, but he was judged as one of the top scholars of US, honored by the president there and also featured by many magazines and journals in the field of computer and information science. What he's going to talk to us is about both design thinking and the way he has used that in his own projects, in his own platforms, one of which is Awaz, which you can talk about. So, Tapan, right now. Thank you to Professor Gupta. You know, Professor Gupta, I first came to him, uh, I think, almost 15 years ago. And I still remember uh, coming to a meeting in this room yeah. where I think we, uh, with uh, President Abdul Kalam, we uh, inaugurated the NIF in this room. So, uh, it's a homecoming in, uh, in, in several ways. So, I'm going to talk about uh, this topic of uh, designing more equitable internet. Um, so, I first came to India in obviously from India, but as a, as a professional, as a researcher, I came in the year 2000. And, uh, and I was teaching at uh, Gujarat Vidyapit uh, on Ashram Road, and I was very influenced by Gandhi and Ideas. So I looked something like this at that point. <laughs> at Vidyapit, I have the traditional wearing a uh, full khadi, so this was uh, my daily outfit, my motorcycle. And so this is when I first met uh, Professor Gupta. Professor Gupta came to give a lecture there at Vidyapit um, when I was teaching there. And uh, I was very uh, influenced by uh, his ideas and his vision of connecting uh, grassroots innovators. And so after I heard his talk, uh, I made an appointment to come meet him uh, in his office here in week 13. And he, uh, he presented this vision, you know, this vision of uh, how he saw uh, the internet and communication technologies more generally uh, as, a, as a mechanism for bridging uh, innovators connecting them with one another and creating really a network of innovators uh, and uh, a database of innovations. Um, but even beyond that, you know, creating opportunities for innovators to create, uh, connect to the outside world, you know, get access to advice, uh, expertise, financing, uh, and all different kinds of, uh, of resources and, and help. And so when he presented this idea to me, it was really um, a very, very uh, uh, ambitious uh, uh, vision. You know, so he, uh, he uh, came to his office and he presented this idea of what he wanted. This was again in 2000, and so what he wanted to see was uh, a real-time network that connected innovators together and supported things like video conferencing, but then not only video conferencing, but then also real-time translation between all of these different Indian languages and between these Indian languages and English. And, and even still, when I see Professor Gupta, he asked me, why haven't we made this yet? Why hasn't... <laughs> this been possible. But you know, if you think about this, and this was in the year 2000 that this vision was, uh, you know, and I'm sure he had it in his mind for many years before that also. And it had elements that you know, weren't even available in consumer internet technologies in the developed world or, or, or to relatively affluent uh, populations. And so it had the, uh, the, the idea of a social network, which wasn't really broadly implemented until Facebook did it in 2004. It had this idea of a multilingual video database, which wasn't really widely available until YouTube did it in 2005. Uh, the idea of video conferencing, which wasn't really, again, widely available until Skype did it in 2003. And then this idea of real-time translation, which isn't, still isn't really possible, except for a very small number of languages. And, 
in, uh, in just the last year, Skype and, and, and Google have made a lot of progress on that problem. And so I just you know, wanted to recognize how forward-thinking this vision was, you know, how, how ahead of its time to think about making all of these facilities available, not to people like you or me, but to all of these very, very um, uh, inspiring and innovative and capable people that Professor Mukupta was meeting uh, in his travels and in his own work. And so in many ways, this set of challenges, this set of uh, functionality that we wanted to provide uh, has been uh, kind of a, a grand challenge, uh, not only for me, but for many people working in this field of information and communication technologies and rural development. And, and so this is a difficult vision to achieve for, for a number of reasons. And, and so I think some of the challenges, so, so I should say, you know, in that first project, you know, I don't think we came very close to, to realizing this vision that Professor Gupta had, but we did make this uh, kiosk-based application uh, called the uh, NoNet Grid, Knowledge Network for Grassroots Innovators, uh, which had a lot of innovative ideas in terms of user interface, networking, uh, data management, and data structures, um, but it was, I think, just a, a starting point. And so I think, you know, one, one thing that this whole process and project helped me realize is that there were a number of kind of very basic and, and fundamental research challenges in achieving this kind of vision of, uh, of uh, extending the reach of the internet and internet uh, life services. And so uh, here are just a few of them in terms of what, what I think makes this kind of uh, task difficult. And so one is just the design of the user interface. You know, how do we design a user interface in such a way that is accessible to broad segments of the population? You know, populations that may speak different languages, that have different levels of literacy, have different kinds of cultural expectations. Also, where is the content going to come from? How are we going to populate this database in terms of useful content? Again, that's applicable to the kinds of challenges that these innovators are facing, farmers are facing, rural uh, populations are facing in general, that's in the local language, that's in the local dialect, that's in a uh, format that's comprehensible to someone that may have limited textual literacy. Also, you know, at this point, uh, infrastructure is also, you know, at that point was a huge issue, it's become less so over time, it's still a major issue, it's just infrastructure. How do we provide this kind of content in areas with limited connectivity, limited power, and also uh, uh, devices. What devices do you use to get this kind of content out? Um, so I think, you know, most of my research has been in the top part of this, you know, user interface content. But we've also done some work in infrastructure. Um, luckily, the device problem has, has, we've made tremendous progress in the device problem through the rapid adoption of mobile phones. And so we're seeing more and more people have mobile phones with various kinds of capabilities that has become, in some sense, like a, uh, a default platform for computing um, uh, in, in rural areas. And, and so that, that's not without its own set of challenges, but I think we've made a lot of progress on in that particular point. Um, by the way, I should say, you know, I'm open to taking questions. You know, I've got a lot of slides. I don't feel particularly um, need, need to get through all of them. And so if people have questions, comments, objections, you know, criticisms, you know, feel free to, uh, to, 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 to share them. So here are some of the projects I'm going to talk about. So you know, a lot of my work has been towards addressing, you know, not really, uh, achieving this vision, but towards addressing some of these core challenges in the design of new technologies for reaching rural areas and rural populations. And so I'm going to be talking about a, a number of these projects: uh, Hisa, Awaz Day, Village Base Station, Local Ground, and uh, Captricity. I don't think I'll get through all of these. There's a lot of projects and a lot of work here. You know, if we end up not covering all of this. Uh, um, so the first project I'm going to talk about is, is, uh, is the first project I did after I left uh, Shristi and, and IAM. Uh, it was a project called Hisab. Hisab was an accounting platform designed for uh, self-help groups. How many of you guys have heard of or have had some experience working with uh, self-help groups? Cody? I'm not sure if it has. So self-help groups, for those of you who don't, who don't uh, know, are, are kind of a form of microfinance. And so they're essentially self-sustaining, very small, uh, savings and credit cooperatives uh, that serve as intermediaries for the delivery of various kinds of financial services. And so one major challenge that I observed in some of our field work with self-help groups was that there was a lot of inconsistency in terms of documentation practices, the kinds of records that were kept, uh, the accuracy of those records, the, uh, the uh, completeness of those records. 
And so this, this created lots of challenges. You know, first of all, it could create potential disputes in the group. It could make it difficult for some of these groups to access outside sources of credit. And so this is a major challenge. And you know, this is, you know, illustrates one of uh, the kind of aspects of design thinking is that before you go and start designing solutions, it's just actually very important to understand the context, understand what people are doing now, what the bottlenecks are in that process, what the real challenges are. And that's a process that can often take a significant amount of time. And so the first thing we did is we went and just observed a number of different self-help groups and self-help group meetings, primarily in two states, Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu. In Tamil Nadu, we worked with a group called uh, CCD, Competent Center for uh, Development. And so here's a typical uh, self-help group meeting that's taking place uh, in the nighttime. Uh, if you look at all these women here, these are the members of the self-help group. And this fellow here is, is someone that they're paying 25 or, or 50 rupees just to be the record keeper because nobody in the group was uh, able to do that. And so this is a person that, that the group will hire uh, to do that on their behalf. And so one thing that I found uh, early on is that a lot of this, these microfinance record keeping base was dependent on the design of these very detailed paper uh, record keeping formats. And so this is a format that allows the group to record each of the transactions that are conducted during a group meeting, to do some basic tabulation and summation, and so on and so forth. So one question I ask the group members is that even if you hire somebody else to do this documentation, how do you make sure that you're being treated fairly? How do you make sure that your records are kept accurately and someone's not recording down the wrong number? So if you make a deposit of 50 rupees or if you make a loan repayment of 100 rupees, how do you make sure that 100 rupees is reported accurately? So we learned some very interesting things from this very uh, basic question. You know, one was, a lot of the women, while they couldn't read and write uh, words, they could read small numbers, the numbers up to three to four digits. There was a lot more numeric literacy there was than there was uh, textual literacy. And so that was a very important um, uh, grounding for the group members in terms of being able to read these small digits and make sure that the right numbers were being written down. The second thing is that they had memorized, actually, the, the format, the tabular format, so in, 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 uh, such that they had memorized which row they were. So each of these rows is for a different group member. So they would memorize which number they are in the table, and also what each of the columns meant. And so they had, there was this kind of spatial memory about what this paper format represented, what the rows represented, what the columns represented, and which were the important ones to pay attention to as the records were being made. So, you know, these, what, what this kind of opened my eyes to, that even if textual literacy is limited, there are other kinds of literacy that we can leverage when we're thinking about user interface design for these populations. And so, in particular, numeric literacy, a familiarity with these kinds of paper forms, and then also this kind of sense of spatial arrangement in the forms themselves. And so, with this kind of basic work, and again, following this kind of design thinking process, we designed some prototypes that we then tested with the groups. And each prototype, had uh, different kinds of functionality, had different designs, we're exploring different design concepts. So here's some of the testing we did. And so again, this is kind of the design thinking process. You, know, you understand con context, you spend some time in the field, conduct research, and then you try to test your assumptions, your, your intuitions using prototypes. And so very lightweight designs that can assess whether or not you're on the right track in terms of how you're thinking about the application and, and its interface. And so we did a number of iterations of this. Here's a, there's one iteration, here's another iteration. And it's kind of funny the kinds of observations that will result from this. And so here's one of the designs that we came up with. You know, we had, uh, this is Goshik, he was one of my collaborators in this project, Goshik Gosh. Uh, he's a you know, very talented designer from NID, you know, had a really great sense of design and layout. Um, so here's one of the designs that Goshik and, and our team made. As you can see, it's very nicely laid out and it's grayscale, and it looks very nice and modern. But when we showed this design to these women, and this woman right here is the Federation president. She's the president of the Federation of SAGs. And her husband is a taxi driver, but she's a very you know, vocal, empowered, assertive woman. And so here she is giving us some feedback on this design, and what she's telling us is that this is not you know, Have you seen our posters? Have you seen our film posters? Is any of them grayscale? Do we have any grayscale posters here? And so she was, what she was referring to is that in Tamil Nadu, you know, there's a, just a love of color, you know, of very rich, vibrant colors. And so clearly we hadn't appreciated that in terms of the context when we were designing these uh, designs that were clearly influenced by uh, other kinds of aesthetics. 
Um, so we went through a number of iterations of this, and so here's one of the designs that we ended up with. And so you can see some of these things kind of that we had observed being played out in this design. More use of color, you know, the use of numbers is very central here, and so the number of service kind of an anchoring reference point for, for what to be looking at. This, we say, we retain this kind of tabular layout, so the women could remember which columns referred to them, and they could use that same kind of knowledge to refer back in this user interface. We designed a set of icons to uh, help uh, communicate other kinds of more abstract aspects of, of the design and the layout. So we took this design and you know we took it to a, a completely new self-help group meeting with a completely new set of women, and we brought in a laptop that looked kind of like this laptop that I have right now that didn't work. Um, and so we took it on a laptop, we put it um, in the village, and, and we asked the women, you know, what do you think? <coughs> this is a, a, an application that's used to keep track of your group meetings. And so we put the you know, laptop in the middle of, of the group meeting after the meeting was conducted, and we said, you know, give us your feedback. And so you have to remember, this is again 2001. You know, 2001, nobody had a mobile phone. And most of the women, if not all of them, had, even if they had seen a computer, they had definitely never actually used it. You know, none, none of the women that we were working with at this time had. I think I'm sure that's changed a lot in the last 15 years or so. And so at this point, you know, when we did this, you know, we put the laptop in the middle, of the group meeting, and you know, the women looked at it, you know, they were looking at it from a distance, you know, like four or five feet, and they said, very nice. Uh, oh, the tech guy. <laughs> very nice, Adonia. You have solved all our problems. This is brilliant. And so we said, you haven't even touched anything. You haven't even used the keyboard or the mouse or the touchpad. You haven't even gone within five feet of this. They said, no, oh, we know. It's absolutely fine. It's great. <laughs> and so, you know, this helped us understand a few more things, you know. Well, first of all, that uh, they just wanted us to get out of it. You know, they, they were already late to go back home and cook dinner or whatever else they needed to do in that evening. They weren't free to spend time with us talking about idle matters. So you know, they wanted to move on with their lives. And you know, most of all, they thought that this was whatever it was, probably pretty useless. Whatever we were, probably pretty useless. And so best to move on. And so that's one thing we realized is that you know, we have to really work hard to establish relevance. The second thing I think we realized is that there was just a basic apprehension or fear about technology itself. You know, it was perceived as something that one was very expensive, two was foreign, not designed or intended for their use, um, and so that created a lot of apprehension. I think people were just didn't feel a familiarity with it, didn't feel like you know if they did something they might break something, they might not you know work properly. That means they would have to take out more loans and you know all other kinds of issues would happen, and so best to just keep a distance from it. And so we thought about, you know, how do we kind of mitigate this apprehension? And so one thing that we made in the design yeah. is, uh, we call this kind of a, 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 a training toolbar. And what we said is that this area of, of the user interface is a relatively safe area. You know, if you click and use the mouse in this area, nothing is going to change with the interface. You're not going to break anything, nothing drastic is going to happen. It's a place for you to just experiment with how the mouse works, how the various buttons work. And so with that, some of the more um, courageous women came, started experimenting with using the mouse, and they started realizing that these were, in fact, different buttons that they could click on and have some effect in the user interface. And once they did that, you know, you know, initially this was like just a silver box that we put there, but now they could actually interact with it and you know, click on things. And so as soon as someone clicked, on one of those icons, it said a little short audio phrase in Tamil. Um, yeah. So that was the feedback that they received. And what that feedback actually was, what that word was, was the meaning of that icon. It, it translated that icon into a word that indicated what it meant. And so as soon as they heard this Tamil word, it actually like completely qualitatively changed their relationship with the technology. You know, this was no longer a strange silver box. It was a Tamil speaking strange silver box. And you know, that actually made all the difference. You know, this box spoke the local language. And it's the same kind of experience you would have as if you went to a, a foreign place or a different state or a small village. And, and you find someone that speaks the same language. You know, and that's just like a it just changes your whole relationship to that place, to that person, is that importance of spoken language. And so this is something we were, we learned, you know, we should have known probably in common sense, but it, you know, it's hard for people who are so conditioned to using text, who are so conditioned to communicating in English, to understand the importance 
of familiarity with spoken language. And so that really helped us understand how important spoken language is in the design of these kinds of user interfaces. And, and I think that's something that's hard for us sometimes to comprehend when we're sitting in office settings and most, for the most part have our computers on mute, especially those kind of notifications and messages on mute. We don't understand how important spoken language is in the design of user interfaces. And so these are some of the things that we learned from this process, you know, how to design icons, how to kind of structure the tasks, uh, how important this audio is, numbers, existing representations, so on and so forth. And so this ended up being my first research paper uh, in this field uh, that was published in 2002 uh, in a conference uh, for uh, human computer interaction. So this is where we got started. And so a lot of the work that I've done since then has kind of built on these basic understandings about user interfaces, user interface design. And I'll talk about another project that kind of follows directly from this work uh, called the Wise Day. That many years later. And so, a lot of things really trying to, at one level, address the user interface problems, but then also address the kind of content problems. You know, as I mentioned, uh, content is a major challenge. And, you know, we want to generate more content that's accessible, relevant, in local language. And so, here's just one representation of the kind of challenges we face. So, this is a, a graphic that depicts user generated content in Google. And so, we can just see it's dominated by a few countries, you know, typically United States, North America, Western Europe. Japan, and huge countries like South Africa, China, India, are really still contributing negligible amounts of content to the internet. And this project, uh, this problem is exacerbated by several orders of magnitude if we talk about local language content, local language audio, for which there's almost no uh, uh, significant representation on, on the current internet. So how do we generate more local language content? So uh, one area of content that has a lot of relevance for people in rural areas is content related to agriculture, day-to-day -day farming practices. And another aspect of this content is that it's often peer-produced and peer-generated. Often the best source of agricultural knowledge is people who themselves are farmers or agrarians or people who live in rural areas. I think the Honeybee Network and the, uh, uh, is, is a great example of this kind of peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing uh, in a lot of the content in the Honeybee Network is related to agricultural practices. So this is one example of kind of peer-to-peer -peer agricultural knowledge sharing. This is a farmer field school. It's a way of disseminating agricultural knowledge uh, in a kind of peer-to-peer -peer fashion. And so you conduct physical meetings, you have some local extension officers that conduct the meeting, you disseminate some information, but then you also leave room for farmers to share their own experiences and to share knowledge with one another. Right? And so the question that we had is how do we replicate this kind of model of farmer field schools but at a larger scale and a more distributed network that can cover entire states or potentially even entire countries. And that was really the, the, the motivation for this project, uh, OASDE, that, that was started uh, about seven years ago. And here we leverage this, you know, as I mentioned, this great progress that we made in terms of devices and that more and more farmers and rural people in general have access to mobile phones. You know, mobile phones are becoming more and more uh, commonplace when you go to villages, small towns, if not ubiquitous. <coughs> but what we saw, you know, and I think this is still true, although less true probably than when we started this project six or seven years ago, is that most of these phones are not smartphones. You know, they're not like Android phones or they're not like iPhones. They're just everyday basic Nokia phones, you know, that have the ability to make phone calls and receive phone calls and SMS. Even if they are smartphones, I think for the most part people aren't really widely using data services yet. So it's not something that's taken off. And so we have to find out how to make this kind of internet-like experience of peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing accessible to people who just had basic Nokia uh, phones. So this is the challenge we had, and this is a project that I conducted uh, with, uh, in collaboration with my PhD student, Neil Patel, who now runs uh, the company, Awazne, that's based on this research. He's based here uh, in Amazon. Um, so the system we designed was essentially a, a voice-based interactive voice response system, an IVR system. So it was a system that when you called, it gave you these basic options. You know, you could ask a question, you could listen to other farmers' questions and the responses they've gotten, and you could hear announcements that are important, so basically news and notifications for, for your area. So it sounds something like this. So uh, the kinds of questions we get, 
you know, or cover all range of agricultural practices, a lot of the different topics. You know, mostly focused on the drought, although we've also uh, conducted a, a, a project in Madhya Pradesh. Um, and so this is one very simple question. But we get all kinds of questions related to pests, diseases, seed varieties, planting times, irrigation, all different things related to, to agriculture and farming in, 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 the, in the global region. So here's one example. So uh, when these questions come in, uh, they're essentially uh, is there is there a way to is there a problem with the audio that we can fix? Yes. Just some audio. So when these questions come in, they're basically handled by a moderator. And so just like a Google group or a mailing list or a discussion forum has a moderator, this. Uh, platform a lot, Google also has a moderator. And what the moderator does is that it uses an interface like this, like an email-like interface, to basically handle each of these messages. And so for each of these messages by handle, what I mean is that they put some additional information in about each of the calls or questions that helps people in the future kind of search or browse or navigate through this uh, repository of questions. And so they'll put in information related to the caller, their name, where they're calling from, but also some categorization of the call, so in terms of the crop that it's dealing with and the topic related to that call. Then what they'll also do is that based on this kind of information, the question will be assigned to a set of potential responders. And so these are experts that are in the network, people who work for NGOs, people who work for the agricultural extension uh, uh, organizations, or even farmers that are known to be experts on some of these topics. And so the question will be assigned to one of them for uh, potential handling. And so when a question is assigned to an expert, they themselves get a call on their phone that gives them the opportunity to listen, to respond, and then if they don't know the answer, to potentially forward it to someone else in their network that might have an answer. So someone in the next village, or someone who works for it. Yeah? Uh, my question is about the questions mm. and the answers that you selected. Is it that you focused on some standard practices, for example, agricultural practices, mm. wherein there will be standard set answers, or is it that you went for you know, giving a little more flexibility, different kinds of uh, giving, looking for variations within standard practices, to what extent have you gone with this? It's really, so I think this is the difference between this and kind of a traditional agricultural extension system. I mean, that it's very demand driven. It's based on the questions that are generated and who else is in the network that might have answers to those questions, right? And so some of the practices are standard and known, and some of them are very kind of experimental, right? And so, uh, you know, so for example, a question like, you know, which kind of climatic conditions are best for cotton? Well, that's a pretty standard answer. You know, there's nothing that's, you know, very uh, 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 you know, unique about it or, or novel about it. On the other hand, you know, we have people in network sharing things like they're sharing on the honeybee network, you know, which is very, you know, new ways of keeping Nilgai out of your farm. And so, you know, one of the farmers in this particular network had made this, you know, contraption with lights and various kinds of noises that would keep the Nilgai outside of their farm. So Nilgai can be a very much a new... It's a predator, it's a blue hole which damages the crop. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a, you know, like a mammal, large mammal that tramples the crop. And so he had made, so it, some of it's a very experimental practices and some of them are just, you know, default answers. Why I ask you this question? Yes. I was wondering that if this the trial phase had been generated some kind of weird answers, mm. okay, then would the user lose credibility and therefore stop using the instrument for the procedure? Yeah. But that's so, not possible. No. But this is a good question. So, you know, so, you know, so the, the difference in this is that it's a, you know, so the difference is that, you know, credibility is not established in a top-down manner. It's established by the community. And so if someone is sharing low-quality information on this network, what would happen is that other farmers would respond by saying, well, I wouldn't trust this particular piece of information. And so what happens in this network is not only one answer is generated. A question is there, one answer comes, but then other farmers, other experts can listen to the exchange and also provide their input, right? And also say, you know, and so it becomes a socially negotiated credibility that happens within this. Just like, you know, for example, on a mailing list. It's not two-way communication. No, not only two-way, it's many to many. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we, I can also go and listen to another farmer's question, what answers are generated, and also provide my own response to it. 
there are more probability yeah. to optimize the answer or more uh, towards the more correct answer. Yeah. Because yeah. there are so many sources of yeah. and, and, real, and realizing that there is a you know that there's a potentially more than one right answer also. You know, there might be one answer right answer from a traditional, you know, kind of industrial farming practices, but then there might be another answer coming from an organic perspective, right? And it allows both those kinds of uh, perspectives to coexist and, you know, farmers to make their own choices about them. This is the idea, you know, this is the vision behind it. You know, how much it's realized, I think, is another question. So once, once uh, the, uh, the expert has gotten uh, assigned a question, he can respond, he can forward, uh, and you can also forward it to somebody else because someone else can ask about that. So uh, then the answer comes back to the original farmer. They can li listen. They can also respond. And so it can be a you know, back and forth if they want to thank the original answer, or they want to ask for more clarifying information, if they want to contest it, so on. And then they can also forward the answer to somebody else if they want someone else to also receive this. And then other farmers, if they call in, then they can just listen to all the questions that are generated. And what we, what we observed is during you know, a, a pilot of this kind of platform, some farmers would just call in and listen to it for half an hour, 45 minutes, and just listen to all the questions that were coming in. And what we actually found out is that some farmers were actually learning a lot from other farmers' questions. They were learning about the kinds of problems other farmers were facing, what were new kinds of pests and diseases that may not have come to their district, but are in a neighboring district and something they should watch out for. So this was a kind of way of farmers to kind of anticipate and learn from other farmers' problems. And also some of them just use it as entertainment, you know, and we had an instance where a local shop owner uh, set up a phone with a speaker, and at 6.30 after everyone had come back, he would just turn it on and they would listen for half an hour and discuss all of these kinds of things. So this is similar to like farmer field schools or for those of you who uh, follow community radio, agricultural programs, like a community a listening group. So it's that kind of model where it's actually used for entertainment and discussion and the, and starting new conversations. And so, except that it's, it's gen that all the content is generated in a completely bottom up way. Yeah? So, uh, actually, the uh, agriculture movement is uh, generated uh, or depends on the geomatical also, mm. or the territory wise. So, how you figure out the answers? As you told that there are so many answers who are coming in, and then you figure out the answer and give it to farmer. Mm. So, how those answers are figured out? It's not filtered as much as the farmer can listen to them all and choose the one that he thinks is most relevant. Right? But actually, he, he don't know anything. That's why he's asking. So how he will choose from those? Uh, that, yeah, that's a good question. You know, and we have thought about things like having things like ranking. You know, you can rank the answers, and that can result in those answers being promoted. And you can have uh, scores for particular users based on how well their answers have been ranked in the past. You see these kinds of things in sites like Stack Overflow. If you've seen right. Stack Overflow, it's got all of this kind of functionality. No, so far we haven't implemented this in so our site. Like and all this stuff. Yeah, like we that. haven't done that, but it's possible to do. So yeah. far, we don't have that volume of answers where it becomes a challenge. You know, you have most two, you know, three answers, and you pick from them based on, you know, you know the person's voice. The other thing I should say is this is, you know, this is not about 10 million farmers. It's at hundreds of thousands of farmers. And so those people who are very frequent contributors, you know who they are. And you know who, who's over time, which ones are trustworthy and which ones are not. And you build up that experience over time and trying things out. And so you know, so that, these, are, these are limitations. So another thing that can be done is that once you, know, you have something, if you have something that you, know, you, you want to let lots of farmers know about, you know, a weather advisory or an alert, or some kind of notification, or some generally informative content, or a particularly good answer, you can also broadcast that. And by broadcast, that what it means is that all of those farmers will receive a phone call with that message, and they are able to listen to it, respond to it, forward to it in the same way. And so um, you can also broadcast it selectively based on people who are in specific districts or farming specific crops. And the system knows this by the database that builds up over time based on what farmers have questions, what questions farmers have asked in the past. So, um, and then you can also respond, and so I mentioned this, you know, it, it's not only a, a two-way conversation, but you can have the whole idea of asynchronous voice threads where multiple people might be commenting and, and, and saying things on, on a particular topic. So, um, we initially implemented this system in, in 2008, and it conducted a number of kind of research projects and experiments 
using it. So I mentioned uh, we had conducted a pilot deployment in 2009. Um, we also compared uh, user input using speech recognition versus touch tone input. And what we found was you know, farmers preferred and were much more accurate using touch tone input, using numeric input, than they were using speech recognition. Um, this was, you know, a lot of people were interested in using speech recognition to navigate this kind of system, but it turned out that's not what farmers preferred. And this is consistent with our prior experience showing that numeric literacy is pretty high, people like interacting with numbers, it's straightforward. So those are some of the early experiments we've done. And I'll talk some more about the more recent work we've done using this platform. So one thing that's, you know, there's been a number of projects, for those of you who have been following this area, there's been a number of projects that are trying to use mobile phones to disseminate agricultural knowledge and information. You know, there's an ISCO project, Airtel project, you know, Reuters has a project, Kia has a project, and there's a lot of different projects like this. So one thing that's unique about the platform that we've developed is that it supports this kind of peer-to-peer -peer sharing of information. The farmers can ask questions of other farmers, answer other farmers' questions, so on and so forth. And so we wanted to under, you know, try to answer this question. You know, what is the demand for this agricultural information from peers as opposed to information from agricultural experts or scientists? And so we conducted this controlled experiment to try to answer uh, this question. So uh, we recorded seven agricultural tips in two voices, you know, uh, two of which came from retired uh, scientists, agronomy professors, and two of which were farmers from different districts. And so for each of the tips, um, it was structured like this, you know, the only difference was the underlying part, you know, and so the scientists would introduce themselves as, hi, I am Dr. X, a retired professor from Y University. The farmer would introduce himself as, hi, I am so-and-so, a farmer from such-and-such such a district. And then the actual content would be exactly the same. They would say exactly the same words about the actual content. And so here is one example related to root rot. And then at the end, the farmer who received this message was able to call back to a specific phone number to receive more information. And if they called back, they would be using their own airtime at their own expense to obtain that additional information. So we measured essentially the response rate. How often did they call back to this number to get additional information when the source was a peer versus when the source was a scientist? And so, uh, interestingly, we found that farmers called back significantly more often, uh, something like 12% versus 7 to 8%, when the source was a peer, was an actual other farmer, right? And so this is interesting, you know, most of the time when you think about this kind of agricultural knowledge, the kind of traditional top-down model of extension, is that you'll want it to get it from a scientist or an agronomist or a trained extension professor. This shows that there is definitely a demand for this kind of knowledge also coming from one's peers. And so this is a, a, an interesting finding for that perspective. And so there's a number of possible explanations from this. You know, one is that it's a bias sample, you know, these could be People who have been using this platform for quite some time, they've gotten used to this kind of content, and so they've become accustomed to it. It could also be that you know they thought this was a fellow farmer, let me support them by calling back and you know, showing my solidarity. But also we find that when we talk to farmers, you know, almost invariably they tell us that they want to get information from scientists and experts. And potentially there's some social desirability to that. You know, they think we're experts, we're scientists, and so that's the kind of answer we'd like to hear. And so when we talk to farmers about you know, why they want information from scientists, they give us you know, explanations like this, you know, very normative explanations. Well, the scientific age and old farming techniques have become obsolete. So if we listen to the scientists, we'll progress. And so this shows that they equate essentially scientists and science with progress. And so, but without really any explanation for why they consider that information to be more credible. Right? On the other hand, why we, when we ask them why they uh, want to get information from their peers, we get these kind of really rich and detailed explanations about farmers having more up-to-date knowledge, having more relevant knowledge, having more contextual knowledge, having more timely knowledge, have knowledge that's actually based on field practices and field experiments. And so explanations that are actually really, really pragmatic related to the actual information needs that farmers have. And so this also leads us to believe that you know, farmers are saying they want information from scientists and experts because they perceive that to be more socially desirable or more aligned with kind of normative expectations as opposed to why they want information from other farmers which is based on the actual practices and knowledge that farmers have. 
And so this, I think, you know, is an area that's ripe for future research. And you know, I think we really need to look at um, how to design these kinds of agricultural knowledge systems, extension systems, in ways that not only support kind of top-down agricultural knowledge dissemination, but also support peer-to-peer -peer exchange. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I'm saying that knowledge systems need aspects of both to be able to be uh, 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 optimally suited. And I think, you know, again, Honeybee Networks, Tristy are excellent examples of how we can do this kind of peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing from farmer to farmer, including experts, including other sources of expertise, in a long-term and, and sustainable way. So we've also been conducting um, a randomized control trial uh, in collaboration with uh, IFMR, Institute for Financial Management and Research in Chennai, and also with uh, Harvard University, that's uh, essentially doing a randomized control experiment looking at the impact of this kind of system on farmers' decision-making, income, yield, so on and so forth. So we've just completed this experiment, and the final data isn't available yet, but we collected data at the midpoint that showed you know, significant numbers of people are using the service, 58% of call, 32% of asked questions, 16% of answer, and also it's having a significant effect on decision making. So farmers that are part of this treatment are more likely to follow the advice that the service is providing. So in one case, using a pesticide for uh, BT cotton that's more effective and less environmentally harmful. And finally, for those people who have access to the service, it's very quickly become their primary source of agricultural knowledge, uh, displacing other sources like the local input the dealer or other people in their village. And so it's been um, really, really um, an influential source of knowledge for farmers that have had access to it. And so this shows that the system is having significant impact on, uh, on, on the farmers that are using it. We should have data from the final evaluation within the next six months. Well, what are the modern users? What are the factors in which influence? That's a good question. You know, I don't think we have the data to be able to understand that uh, exactly. Well. It's still an open question. I don't have an answer right now, but it's a great question. It's something worth looking into. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a key limitation. Not everyone is still using the service. One thing we found more is also, you know, this is one potential explanation. The more educated the farmer is, the more likely they are to use the service and to benefit from it. Right. And so there's still this kind of barrier in terms of education and literacy. Uh, finally, you know, one thing that we found is that when we, you know, for example, when we told farmers to use that particular pesticide, we also told them why they should use it, you know, what the mechanism was. And when we went back and asked them, they, told, they could tell us they were using that, but they couldn't tell us why they were using it. And so it still seems, for the most part, farmers are following the advice that they're receiving by a rope. You know, they're just following along, and they're not really understanding why, and, and building a knowledge base for what's going on. And so I think there's still some challenges there in terms of how to increase basic capability and literacy and for farmers using Yeah? But is it a question that they don't understand or is it a question that they are unable to articulate? That's a great it question. Is also yeah. 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 That's a good question. I think this was a particular question was posed as a multiple choice, you know, and, and we didn't show that farmers had. But yeah, it could be that also. It could be that they didn't understand the choices or they didn't understand that. Yeah, that's, that's a possible So, you know, we get a lot of uh, positive feedback, so here's one example, you know. The interesting thing here is, you know, he, this farmer is just really happy that, you know, he is able to just ask a question and get the answer just sitting in his house. And so this is something we've all gotten so accustomed to on our phones, on the internet, using Google search, is just to get our house and get an answer. Uh, and so this was a, something that we found. Um, one other thing is that, you know, as soon as uh, he gets the, uh, the, the answer, um, he, 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 as, soon as, as soon as he says this, he just asks another question, right? And so it just shows that he's, you know, appreciating the service, but he's appreciating the service as a way of building social capital so that he gets the answer to the next question, right? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it, it shows people are committed to this. Um, we also had some examples of people contributing poetry and songs and all different kinds of content. You know, on this particular service, other farmers weren't so happy about it because instead of getting agricultural information, they were listening to someone singing a song, often poorly. And so, uh, so you know, they, they requested the person to stop. And so as a result of this, we realized that there were lots of other kinds of information that farmers and other people wanted to share. And so that's what led us to uh, essentially uh, launch this as not only a service for farmers, but just as an open platform for anyone who wants to host or
or create this kind of voice service. And so uh, we have a number of different groups using this currently for delivering anything from educational information to health information to information for labor activists. We have a very active user here who's been using this service for uh, connecting labor activists with workers and also for, uh, for various kinds of educational organizations. And so uh, you can yourself, if you have any use or something like this, go check it out at uh, Wad Day or Um, so one, one service that we've launched is a service called uh, Kim Thafi, which was the uh, evolution of this work. And so it's kind of this voice-based information service uh, reaching 16,000 farmers right now. And we drop, farmers receive weekly advice and can also share their own experiences. You know, one thing that, you know, we, that shows the kind of engagement with this kind of platform is that, you know, we send 16,000 voice messages every week. And, you know, typically it's twice or three times a week. So up to 50,000 voice messages in a week. And we have a more than 70% pickup rate. So that means 70% of farmers pick up that phone call on the first call. You know, they pick it up immediately, repeatedly, you know, over a period of months. And so it just shows that for most of these farmers, they really value the content they're receiving. Um, one key question we have with services like these is how do we make it sustainable? You know, how do we make this kind of you know, the information service uh, sustainable? What is the right model for doing that? That's still a very open question for us. And we're looking at various ways of doing it. Um, another thing I should say is you know, we're also very actively looking for interns, people who want to work with us on questions like this. You know, how do we make these kinds of services uh, sustainable? So if you're interested at all, you can contact me, you can contact Neil, and we'd be happy to talk to you. So that's a, a was day. Any more questions about that? So um, here, here's some future research questions we're interested in. You know, could we use this as a platform for understanding how knowledge diffuses within farmer networks, you know, who are sources of information, who are receivers of information, what influences adoption of agricultural practices, what are some incentives for creating content, you know, why do people answer other farmers' questions, can we create an incentives for them to do that, um, as I mentioned, looking at impact, and also how do we track and measure user engagement. So I mentioned this uh, figure of 70% pickup rate, well, that's one measure of user engagement with the service. You know, other measures are how long people listen or how often they contribute. Now, this creates kind of a real-time uh, metric for us to be able to track how much people are engaging with our content, with our services. And so could this be a model for other civil society groups, governments, nonprofits to in real time measure their, their uh, constituencies' engagement, right? And so for a lot of NGOs, for a lot of government services, there's no way um, from the outside knowing how effective they are uh, in actually engaging with their target population. So this is one way potentially of doing that. Yep? Uh, as a tool that uh, you are now your platform is open for having or any other women and uh, some few organizations who are using it right now. So in agriculture you can say that you can keep the open information to anyone and, and if the weather is not good or geometry or directly and that's fine, mostly you will lose something. But uh, particularly for health, I want to ask that uh, you should have authenticated data to deliver it to your users. And how do you manage all the things? Yeah, I mean, I, we, I, you know, we, we, we don't doubt the credibility. Of, it's just like a, we're a platform like Google Groups. You know, people can be using it for good purposes, people can be using it for not so good. We try to. At some level, you know, people have grievances, we're open to receiving that kind of feedback. There's no way we can go and check all of the individual people who are offering these kinds of messages or services and so on. So I think it's uh, basically buyer beware. You know, these groups. And most of, for the most part, it's, you know, it's groups that are you know, already known and incredible. You know, it's not like these are people who are springing up you know, out of thin air. You know, it's an organization that's already been involved with a particular population, that's already been involved in delivering service to that population, already has some uh, credibility within that group, and now they're using this as a way of uh, increasing their touch points or, or uh, increasing their reach, um, and, and not someone that's just coming out from scratch. And trying to because uh, right now, uh, as you said, by year, but now <coughs> the era is going for the three-year and five-year guarantee and warranty period. Mm -hmm. So as if we are getting or delivering an information that it should be, I think, authenticated or legal uh, for a particular domain, for agriculture, 
food agriculture is so location specific depending upon weather, soil, cultural practices and even the interaction with other local factors like pest, disease, yeah. so on. So, guarantee for even the seeds is not given by the companies today. You know, this has been a demand for farmer organizations that seed companies must give performance guarantee. But no seed company gives it. The farmers buy it, taking a little risk, but draw assurance from the reputation. So if a lot of farmers feel that seed of X company is bad, then they will start talking about it and the company will lose business. So I think the reputational capital is a greater degree of guarantee, at least in the peer-to-peer -peer 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 like this, than any other friend or other people will not share. Suppose you hold me liable for telling you that look, you can grow carrot office near a personal field and carrot office will attract the creators and creator will tell the pest. Now assume for a minute that they, it didn't happen. You didn't have that creative operation in the neighborhood because everybody was using their pet pesticide. If you are going to sue me for that, then I'm not going to share information with you. So then the whole social structure will collapse. Yeah, so sir, I'm, I agree with you on that point, but what I'm saying is for the particular domain, or particular things in any domain. Now, if anyone is asking for the how we, I can get subsidy for this particular thing, then this is the legal issue. If you no, are delivering so something, they are not getting it. I don't think they are getting it. You are not giving any legal or someone no. asking you like that how we can get this or that in agriculture. It's not for government services. No, actually, no. Uh, question can be anything from farmer side. They don't know no. particular. If some other farmer says that look, I got this subsidy like this. Okay. You can also try. That's fine. But the so just information sharing platform. Okay, so it's open. We can it's basically peer learning also. Yeah. Yeah. Learning. More peer learning than ever. What, what I should say is, you know, this Kato is, this is a service that we're running. We're creating the content for it, we're delivering it. Most of all the other services are run by different organizations, you know. So I gave, I gave this list here. All of these organizations are the one providing content. And all of the content is going out under their name. And so they're responsible for it, their credit, their, it's based on their reputation, not a lost reputation. So you are a platform provider. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So uh, this is a, a last thing. Any, any other questions? So now we're going to talk about, um, so I mentioned, you know, kind of content, user interfaces. So I'll talk a little bit about infrastructure also, you know, and so I'll talk about this project, uh, Village Base Station. So uh, the challenge here is that, uh, Rethinking cellular from the bottom up. The channel, this is a joint project with another graduate student named Curtis Heimerl, who's just graduated from Berkeley. And so the challenge here is that there's a lot of people all around the world, Asia, Sub Saharan Africa, North America, still without access to cellular connectivity and data services, right? So in India, if you look, you know, we're making a lot of progress towards solving this problem. I was traveling around in Gujarat around this time this time. And I saw, you know, compared to even two or three years ago, there's a lot of connectivity in a lot of places. But the reason for that is that India has very high population density in most of the country. So that means that putting up a cellular base station is for the most part at least not a loss-making proposition. On top of that, you know, we have things like the universal service provision, uh, regulatory frameworks that actually makes a requirement for operators to offer services in rural areas. Um, and this isn't, you know, always true and, uh, in other parts of the world, you know, in particular parts of Sub-Saharan Africa or sparsely populated parts of Canada or uh, even Alaska or uh, Southeast Asia. Here, you know, the economics and the regulatory frameworks don't necessarily support cellular provision in these kinds of areas. And, and there's a various kinds of reasons for this. You know, first of all, it's very expensive to provision for remote areas, uh, providing equipment there, powering that equipment, you know, how good the network is to connect to the rest of the, the uh, country, uh, the roads for even getting this equipment in there. You know, many of these cellular towers in remote places are not connected to grid power. Uh, they're actually run based using diesel generators, and so they have to regularly have trucks go there to deliver the diesel, and so on. And so this becomes very, very expensive. On the other hand, because there aren't many users, and because those users aren't using many services, that means that there's not a lot of revenue. And so the economics really doesn't support uh, establishing cellular infrastructure in these kinds of areas. On the other hand, for people who actually live in those places, uh, connectivity is crucial. You know, they would really, really want to have connectivity there, and they might even be willing to pay some of the overheads of getting that connectivity there if they had that possibility. Right? And so 
so that's led to our work in creating this kind of village base station that allows local organizations to basically set up and uh, establish their own cellular networks. And so some of the features of this base station are that it's low cost and low power. And so while a typical cellular base station can be hundreds of thousands of dollars, this one has a total cost of materials around $2,000. And it's also very low power, running uh, on an average of 50 watts. Um, it can provide several kilometers of coverage based on line of sight. And it provides various kinds of services, typical cellular services like voice, SMS, and data, but also things like location and presence, which most mobile networks don't provide. And so it looks something like this, just like a suitcase with a bunch of uh, equipment inside. And so one way we can make the cost low is by using existing infrastructure and resources. And so here you see that instead of a, a physical tower, we just put the antenna in a tree. You know, the tallest tree in the village, and that's where you put the antenna. And you know, uh, for the uh, actual human resources needed to put the tower in the tree, you know, we use local people who are you know experienced in climbing the tree, and so that reduces our cost uh, significantly by you know using whatever local resources are, are available. And so, um, one way we've been able to make this uh, uh, low power is that uh, there the, the cellular network essentially turns off at night. And so when there isn't a lot of usage, we can turn the cellular network off, and that means that we won't be uh, consuming that power in times when it isn't used very much. Now that creates another problem in that, what if there's an emergency? You know, what if there's an emergency <coughs> and we have to use a cellular network? Well, that's mitigated in two ways. Uh, the way it works is that if it doesn't shut off completely, it goes into a low power mode. And in that low power mode, we can turn the antenna on if one, it receives an incoming message. So if you get a message from outside that has to be handled, it's able to turn that transmitter on, deliver that message, and then turn itself off. If an outgoing message has to be generated, if there's an emergency in the village that someone else needs to know about, there's also, we've created a, a low power transmitter that can communicate with a smaller antenna on the base station to turn it on. And so essentially we can put in the village, in the central square, or in somebody's house, or in Panchayat office, just a button that communicates with the base station that's able to turn it on, and within a few minutes the antenna will come up and uh, you'll be able to have communications again. And so using these kinds of functions, you know, we found that we were able to reduce the power consumption of the tower uh, by over 40% uh, in the nighttime. So uh, this uh, particular uh, technology is now deployed in several locations. But our first deployment was in uh, a, a remote part of Papua, an island in Indonesia, uh, way up in the mountains. And here this is a partnership with, between a local wireless internet service provider that was providing essentially uh, VSAT connectivity to, uh, to this village, a uh, missionary school, and, and the local community. And we were providing uh, voice and SMS services locally within the network, and then outside between the network and the rest of uh, the world, we were providing SMS only. The reason for that is that this uh, base station is connected to the network using a VSAT connection, which is pretty uh, high latency and expensive, and so it would have been prohibitive to send voice over that. So we only allowed SMS between uh, that base station and what, what the rest of the world. What's the cost involved in the of this uh, voice SMS or voice? What's that? What's the cost factor involved? For, for the users? For the users. Yeah, for the users, you know, this was determined based on the local community decides what to do. And so, uh, local SMS is uh, two cents, uh, local voice is two cents a minute, and outside SMS is nine, nine cents. And how does it compare with the uh, Canadian cheap, quite cheap. It's comparable for this. Day, for you this. Know, one cent is, let's say, 60 rupees, if you look at the general one cent would be one by 0.6, 60 pesos. This is pretty comparable to um, what it was. And so this was done, you know, the, the model is similar to how it works here also. We had local resellers, local airtime resellers, who actually resold the airtime. So they were able to buy it in bulk and then resell it, and they made a small margin. And, and so they determined, you know, together what the pricing should be. Yep. I mean, we were a little bit curious about what are the regulatory issues that you face when you deploy this thing? Uh, that's a great question. You read the Indonesia, I mean. That, that's yes. a great question. But it's not yet. If anyone's interested, we can talk about it. But you know, so that's a very good question. 
it operates, it's technically illegal, <laughs> what we're doing, but it operates in kind of a gray area. Okay. So the, the uh, Indonesian equivalent of the FCC, yeah. they know that we're doing this. You know, it's not something we're hiding or it's not unknown to them. They basically are, have adopted a policy of we don't care. And kind of the unspoken understanding is if that if one of the existing operators wants to come to this region, then we'll move out. We've just recently uh, created a new technology, a new aspect of this. So you know, the problem here is spectrum, right? Spectrum, this is licensed spectrum, it's not unlicensed spectrum. Yes. And each, in the spectrum, each operator gets a tiny fraction of it. And right now, we're infringing on some of those spectrum licenses. You know, in India, you know a lot about spectrum licenses. You know, for good or for bad. Yeah. <laughs> no, but for public good, if some areas, you said, will not be broadcasted properly by radio, in will it end now? I mean, in Tibet, you can have a local radio station to teach yeah. the schools there. Yeah. You can't bring the teachers there, but I mean, if you can, you know, to, to get into those modes and yeah. get it done, I think they can work out. Well, this is exactly why this network was set up by this missionary school, because they wanted good teachers to come there. But mm -hmm. good teachers won't come there if they can Absolutely. communicate back with their families. Yeah, yeah. So they needed a network like this for these teachers to communicate back with their families. And so that's exactly why they wanted this. Yeah. So we just created a new technology that allows that base station to actually find an unused <coughs> frequency. Okay. So it can actually look through all of the spectrum and find a frequency that's not used. If one becomes used, it can actually jump frequencies, right? And so it's using the idea of what's called GSM white space. Yes, yes. It's yes. unused. We actually got a project last time in this innovation award that we gave, and one of the projects was exclusively on that. All the television channels, they have the TV band white spaces, yeah. okay? Yeah. So if those white spaces can be allocated for such exercises, I think legally yeah. it can be done and it could be easy to. The TV white spaces, the problem there is then you need all different kind of equipment. Okay. Your existing handsets won't work there. Okay. okay. Right? Okay. The advantage of using GSM white space is that then you can just, and they use their existing mobile phones. Right. And so for these people who live in this particular village, right. even if they don't have connectivity, a lot of them have mobile phones. Yes. They have mobile phones for listening to music, they have mobile phones for when they go to the town, they can make phone calls, so on and so forth. Oh, and so using GSM, you know, the advantage is that we don't have to provide them new devices. Yes. They can use the devices they already have. What are the range of this? Uh, it, can, it depends on the antenna, but anywhere from, you know, using a, a low cost antenna, you know, three to five kilometers. You know, one of the things that they, and what the cost of the setup? Uh, around $2,000. One of, the See, the, one of the issue I've been waiting for a long time is that small shopkeeper or a small fabricator mm -hmm. or a catering shop or uh, a barber says, look, I'm free for two hours. Anybody wants to get haircut, please come. Now, he doesn't want this message to go beyond five kilometers. He has local advertising needs. And there's nothing. And the current system will charge him the same cost that if you were to advertise all over the world. So there's a huge need for unlocking the entrepreneurial potential of local societies. Right. Education. I, I'm not able to understand this question. Can anybody teach me? <coughs> yeah. And the lady other way, other, in other house says, okay, do this, multiply first this, then this, then this. Yeah. And the kid can say, okay, thank you. Right. And then, I understood now. Right. Whole range of needs uh, can be harnessed, can be met, if we can reduce the cost. Yeah. Two thousand dollars is too much. Yeah. But I mean, there's you know, other things that this provides. You know, in your typical mobile network, so if you're using Skype or if you're using Google Chat, you know, I get a lot of additional information. I can see whether or not you're online. If you allow to me to look at that, I can also know where you are. You know, I can pinpoint this information. You know, mobile network operators, they don't give you access to that kind of information, right? Now, if you have control of the infrastructure, you can actually selectively provide access to that kind of information also. You know, with privacy protection. Is there a chance for the price coming down in the near future? Of this technology? I think, you know, always gradually will come down. I see, supposing you disconnect it from the main GSM yeah. network, make it only local, yeah. then what happens? No, that's not the main cost. The main cost is the antenna. So that's what, no, yeah. so that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So if we make it only 5 kilometer local discussion peer to peer, yeah. then what the cost? No, it's still the same. Because the antenna I need is the local antenna. That's the one that costs money. That antenna costs... Here from the wireless loop. Yeah. Wireless and wireless. Yeah, yeah. That costs money. I think in the long term it'll come down. It'll probably come down by half in the next five years. So if you put it on the existing uh, telecom tower. Yeah. That's a lot. That's already, we're not counting the cost of the tower. And right now, the cellular towers, that's the most expensive cost. Is the, act. the most expensive cost is the tower and the power. You know, the diesel that's needed to run the tower. You know what Ashok had done? Yeah. He had put a small base station to release the relay. So supposing I have a 1 kilometer, yeah. 
I have one day. So instead of getting message uh, all through for 5 km or 2.5 km radius, I do it for 500 meter radius yeah. and then have a bay. Will that reduce the cost? I don't think so. Yeah. I think with using current technology, this is about as cheap as you can get it. It's probably even, you know, if you factor in all the costs, it's probably even more than 2,000. It's probably close to 5. Now, this is just, you know, not counting some of the recurring. So we can, we can look into it. Actually, this work has also been turned into a, a startup which is providing this as a product. And I think the cost of their basic setup is somewhere between five to ten thousand dollars. Where? Where? What? Where? The service? Where? No, it's in the uh, house. It's in a uh, Berkeley. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, you know, for basically uh, operators or groups that want to... So for a campus like ours, for yeah. example. Yes. I mean, we have about, you know, thousand and odd students and they use double the network, but they use it, a lot, lot of it goes, seventy percent maybe for internal maybe, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. And they do assignments and all that. We are, we are loading the broadband for that. Which is better, this could be done easily yeah. on the local system. Yeah. I mean, if you can you get approval for it, you know, in Berkeley, we've set up our own, we've set up our own cellular network. So we get approval from FCC, yeah. yeah. It doesn't cover the whole campus, it just covers a part for testing purposes. It's not, it's not for the general population, it's just for our own testing. We got approval from the FCC to do that, actually. Okay, okay. Same, same, same? Thing? Yeah. No, and there, there's also other potential for, you know, this is for GSM. If you want broadband connectivity, there's some other technologies, other solutions that are useful for that. Mm -hmm. But I think we're making a lot of progress. Again, these were challenges, you know, we were looking at 15 years ago with, like, Cordex and wireless and local loop, right? But I think technology's gone beyond that. Any other questions? So, you know, we've had, this has been in operation for, uh, you know, almost two years now and steadily growing in the number of users. <coughs> And in services, you know, one interesting thing you can see is that initially it was largely used for communicating with outside. And so for many, this is a one island in Papua. The main island in Indonesia is Java. And so a lot of people go to Java to study or to work. And so initially what it was used a lot for was SMS with those people who have left. And so instead of going to the town to call or to SMS, you can just do it from the village itself. But you can see over time, you know, you're seeing more and more local SMS, local phone calls. So as people get used to the idea of having a network there locally, they're starting to use it locally also. Before you have just gone to somebody's house and just talked to them or waited to see them, now people are starting to use it locally also. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is yet to be seen, but you can see that the usage is increasing in that way also. Um, here, you know, just some feedback. This fellow just says he doesn't have to go to the next town to make an SMS. You know, it's a four-hour drive to get to this next major town, and so it's a major savings of time, uh, eight to nine hours round trip, to make phone calls, I can just relax here, sitting in forest, roasting Kasaba, and making SMS, right? So good for him. You know, they can SMS their family, who are far away, to Jakarta, so on and so forth. And finally, this one guy is a little bit more idealistic, like kind of in a wise day motivation, voice of this rural area can now be heard. Uh, at the same time, you know, some parents, elders, are now getting concerned, especially with the increase of local use of calls and local use of SMS, that now young people are able to talk to one another without being observed by the elders. <laughs> and so, we our parents have sons and daughters who are teenagers, who have been under tight supervision by parents, but now with this new network, they can SMS with one another and we can't keep track of it, right? And so there's a lot of, also, potential uh, apprehension about <laughs> the new possibilities that this kind of network. So um, here you can see, you know, cost of outgoing SMS is nine cents, local SMS is two cents, incoming is free. Now one other thing that we've been able to do is that we've been able to create our own short codes. And so we've given the village doctor his own short code. And so the doctor is able to make free calls, all calls to the doctor are free, SMS for the doctor is free, so on and so forth. And so we can create our own short code services essentially for services that we feel are important within this village. Um, there's a lot of credit transferring also as people are starting to use the ability to transfer airtime as a way of creating small financial exchanges. And uh, over this period, we've also seen that basically uh, the tower is able to pay for itself in a period of two to three years. And so in a period of two to three years, you can cover all of the initial capital investment that you make. So it can be financially this is a for what period? I think this period is for about uh, 15 months. Over 15 months, yeah. this is what was yeah. Yeah. For right, about, you know, anywhere from going from 50 to 500 users. So, so 
So they, they, they've also launched this as a startup company, it's called Indaga, and it offers this basically as a turnkey product for setting up your own cellular network. Good. Awesome. They can offer more, but then it will go up in price. So the, this is a company which provides that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. Indaga.com. Okay. Which means that's all for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, again, it's buyer beware. They'll provide you the hardware. <laughs> 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 that's right. This is our, now, if you start using it in your country and it's illegal, well, you know, you use this equipment. It's like a long distance Wi Fi, uh, you know, those wireless. They're all governed by the local rules. Yeah. They will say. Yeah. <clears throat> you can buy the equipment. Legal I mean, this, this technology that they use gone up to one kilometer, two kilometer, you have wireless phones. Yeah, yeah. Why can't we expand that? Well, that's very cheap actually. But you should allow, in fact. Huh? And regulatory yeah. should allow. I mean for No no. In India we can have huh? okay, we can use it to one huh? kilometer, two kilometers. Yes. Okay. yes, phones, wireless phones. So you can use up to two kilometers. Huh? So from base to the phone, you can get up to two kilometers. Yeah. So yeah, of course it's one to one. Like you have it? You have wireless phones that can go two kilometers, I think? Yes. No, no, that's not. You must be using radio frequencies. Maybe. That's right. They, yeah. Yeah. they may not be existing phones, though. I mean, is it a special phone? No, no, it's special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Special phone. And that's a small antenna, not the right thing. <coughs> yeah. One limitation with this is that it's based on using existing phones. And so it's limited by. So radio frequencies are lower frequencies, they have can travel at lower and longer distance. And that these are using GSM frequencies. Well, then you have to use dedicated devices. New devices, you have to have new devices. If you use new devices, there's a number of different technologies. In fact, um, what's his name? Um, this professor at IIT Bombay. Oh, yeah? No. Networking guy. Uh, he's been looking at some of these low power new ah. devices. And what is the operational you know, cost in Operational cost. It's basically power, and then um, maintenance. What are maintenance? You might be sort of. There should be some, you know, uh, uh, what to say, catchment area which should provide that operational cost. Yeah. Okay, and the bigger the number of people using the mobile phone, so uh, easy, you know, it be easy for you know getting that you know operational cost. Yeah. But suppose uh, chances for growing this uh, network. I don't think it is uh, more. Yeah. In, in a not uh, less appropriate area. Yeah. You have to get some minimum number of users. Yeah, exactly. you minimum number of users, you know. But here we've been able to show financial sustainability with you know on the order of two hundred users. You know, that rough amount. So it, you know that and with current levels of pricing and usage and adoption and so on and so forth. We did some calculations to say you'll recoup your capital investment and your running costs in a period of two to three years. Those are the calculations we did. With less users, with different pricing. I mean, with less users, obviously, we have to do is make the pricing higher. I mean, that's the obvious thing, right? But you know, you may be willing to pay that if you're, if you're far enough away. You may be willing to pay that for certain amounts of communication. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the economic angle of mind, interest would be that you know, I I, I, was, I used to hear you many times. Most of your PhD project that we have guided, and now I'm reading a couple of startups like I was there now. In Indian context, if you look at similar research that's happening out in different labs now, we seldom listen about those things. So, what what is that behavior in missing in? No, I, I don't know. know. I think you have to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what I can say, what are the enabling factors where, where I am? So, one of the enabling factors is that there is a very robust uh, angel incubator yes. venture capital. Yes. So they, they give you assurance of subsistence for two years at least. Is that like a good critical role? Yeah, because you know companies are able to raise anywhere from a quarter million dollars to 1.5 million dollars before they even leave Berkeley. And so that means you, know, you can support your own salary, yeah, you your own at, lifestyle. You know, you I was looking at the list of these companies that have come out from projects of a couple of professors like you in their departments. Yeah. And out of 10 PhD thesis, 7 are going into startups. <laughs> So, I mean, that's a high so that's, that's one, that's one. <laughs> Second, you know, I think it's people, students, you know, want to do it. You know, they, they feel motivated, they feel supported, they see other examples, proximate examples of success. Uh, there's a local ecosystem that supports them, provides them working environment, working capital, so on and so forth. 
Um, and then they have mentorship, and you know, not only professors, but they have mentors, other mentors they can draw from within the community, within that environment. You know, I think in India, there people are trying to do this. You know, there's the CIIE on the campus, which is trying. You know, I think it's doing its level best to create this kind of environment here. Um, so I don't know, you know, which exact part here is missing, but I do know. Even you know, so I should say, you know, I am in the Bay Area in Berkeley. I can tell you that it would probably be much harder to do this at CMU in Pittsburgh, for example, okay. right? Um, or even at Georgia Tech, or even at University of Washington in Seattle. Because the Bay Area is just a special place where you, know, you have access to networks that you don't have access to anywhere else. And so, um, but and that's not to say that it's not possible in other places, it's just that I think the barriers to doing it are less. Should we open for any Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we could open for the next 15 minutes. Anybody else wants to throw an issue in the broader space of frugal design? Broader, broader space of creating democratic platforms for uh, reinforcing democracy, local democracy for people who could have That's a sense of, I think yeah. that you've said, yeah. one underlying factor is how to reinforce democracy which does not alienate from people, local people from local people. And yes. Today we seem to be connected globally, but we don't seem to be connected to our neighbors, to our communities. So how do you create, how do you restore communities? How to reinforce communities? Or do you bring the country back into the discourse of development? So I'll just, maybe I'll just give you briefly say which other project, you know, this one project with the Sarah Van Wart, my other students. So this is a project we built a platform for supporting youth to use data to better understand their communities and advocate for their communities. So it's a mapping data collection platform. So very much aligned with the same kind of idea. Yeah. Online mapping, data collection, data analysis platform. So again, you know, here's the same goal we have. How do we get people to engage more deeply with their communities? have a greater voice in what their community is doing, how it's growing, how it's advocating, what it's advocating for, so on and so forth. So open to any questions, comments, suggestions. So, yeah. so uh, regarding the KU project, mm. you told that how to make it sustainable. Mm. So I was thinking from a solution that you can provide uh, Advertisement for certain fertilizer company or something. So can that be sustainable? Can that be sustainable? We were exploring that. You know, I think there are challenges there are one, so far we haven't seen many fertilizer companies want to explore that. They think it's a compelling idea, but willing to invest money we haven't seen so much. So they can afford cable TV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is cheaper. Yeah. Yes. And which is more universal than this. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, cable TV is more universal. Yeah. Yeah. There are more people who have television than who have that the JSF phones. If you look at the total number. But sir, now if we count that, this was in 2001, right? This, no. Uh, Kiru Sati. Kiru Sati is right now. Right now. No. So the uh, increasing mobile penetration now in rural areas can enable this. No, but the other thing is, you know, cable TV has not only wider reach, but it has less cost of delivery per person. You know, if you're sending a phone call to each person, for each impression, each impression you're getting, you're paying 60 paisa to 2 rupees. So that's a very high cost per impression. Cable TV is 1 rupee a month, 1 rupee a day, 30 rupees a month. Yeah. I think Roshan, Roshan works for a while. Please, please tell us. Actually, it's coming back to your point. I think it's very relevant to all of these sort of democratic peer networks. So the main issue with Kimsat is that they are mostly small farmers. So if they were very rich farmers, people would pay 100 rupees also to reach them. But these are just guys who are, I mean, some of them have 5 acres, 6 acres, so they are serving. Most of them are within 1, 1.5 acres. So they are not really, uh, you know, hot for enterprises. Similarly, they are in the middle of Surinder Nagar, so it's not a major agro district. So the advertisers, literally they are saying, hey, kya kaam hai? Is, is se kya kaam hai? So they don't, that, Local advertising definitely still possible. It may be the local seed shop will want to. That's invest. what I'm saying. Let us think about that. That's, and that's, See, that's if I have an idea capacity for two hours, yeah, yeah. I can shave five people in this period. Yeah. Then I earn about you know ten, seven, eight, ten rupees per person and get fifty rupees. I can pay you five rupees out of fifty rupees. You know, it doesn't cost too much. You get my clients because it's very targeted. Very targeted. targeted. Yeah. And it is a some cost. No, of course. My capacity is already fixed. Because IFCO in Haryana is not interested in five guys in this taluk. No, but why don't we work on that? Let us do an experiment on that. No, it's, it's happening. So anyone, I mean, we are waiting for. It. Ah, so let us work on. See, a startup, for example, wants some data to be collected 
Uh -huh. I mean, here is a friend. <laughs> why don't think? Why shouldn't we do an experiment on peer-to-peer -peer learning, for example? Or grandmother, my, my child is crying, I, what should I do? And there's no other elderly person at home. Another grandmother says, Are jai for giske laga do bhai. <laughs> you understand? So, usko ta aram mil jayega, koi nuksan nahi uska. Why not we make all grandmothers of the community available to all the grandchildren of the community? Has that experiment uh, kasit hain
queries about what problem did they face, how did they solve, and for education, I mean, so use kar liya. I think there is a problem for education. Scientific problem, at least math may not be, but for science, it can be very useful. Yeah. Evaporation, I want to understand the concept of evaporation. There are so many different ways of explaining evaporation. There could be different ways. I think that 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 is good because. For long, long time, the real issues will be good teachers. And we have done create a toll-free number so that children can access the content without paying for it. Yeah. That will be the for that I'm sure we can find some sponsor. That will not be impossible. Yes. So if we can create open source oral content, which explains the oral call is cheaper, but video call is very costly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if it's oral, how much is the experience generally? What duration is the most call? Average call. Yeah, uh, what is it? From 30 seconds to 3 minutes? Like, if Kirukshati is a stream of uh, you know, continuous content, people re listen for about uh, 5 and a half minutes. 2, 5 and a half minutes? Yeah, but, yeah. But there are a few people, like you were saying, some shop owners will play it repeatedly 7 or 8 times. So, what are almost 45 minutes. Why would they do that? Uh, for people to listen. Like, oh, it's, 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 it's free. It's a missed call. So, huh. you know, missed call, like, then when it comes out, they keep it on. Okay. Yeah, you keep listening. Very interesting, very interesting. So children can do the same thing. If one kid, kid didn't follow the Dubara Batao, he just presses another call and then it comes again. So how have you done this academic experiment? I mean, schools may which was? Yeah, I'm very much sure. We are working on yeah, yeah. Uh, We actually have made a version of this specifically for, one is for teachers to teachers. So just like you have farmers to farmers, now there's teacher to teacher. Uh, it's in rural Ajmer and also in, uh, we're going to start in, uh, uh, in Bihar. How much does it cost to set it up? Nothing. I mean, there's no cost of set up. I said only the cost of calling. No, so how do you recover your... Uh, so it depends. I mean, it's usually some NGO is doing it. So we try to help them. So let's say Ajmer, how much did it cost to that NGO to create? Uh, so they had a budget of uh, 15,000 rupees. So in 15,000 rupees, we were able to do about uh, three months. 15,000 years. Yeah. It was just teachers to teachers. So there were totally 500 teachers. Yeah, Karraji, I'll give you a little bit. I'm serious about it. I'll give you a little bit of money. No, they were masters. That's not this. So we had already used, yeah, they we, had been, we had been for the awareness program. Like, How did it work? It was good, like, but we could not uh, do awareness for the number a lot. No, no, but the question is, it should also be that what requirements are there. I went there, I was asked this question. Did you, are you sure that you have done this? No, 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 they also ask this. And this one particular, this form is not to be filled in this manner, but that manner. Yeah, so there will be a lot of experiential transition calls that people have overcome by just going there. Yeah, just effectively. That saves time yeah. for others. So that's what we were discussing today, like, before the session. Like, Achha. And this year we have been like, also tracking the And we'll do that for the Anipi uh, Network database also. Let us do that from Storm over to you. Yeah, yeah. Then are you going back? On Sunday. And then, so, because we need to create as many democratic open access databases as possible. I think that's the challenge. And uh, we should really aim at you know motivating students to do that. In every field, every field. Servicing your two-wheeler, uh, two a low-cost uh, mobile. How do you say, what are the things that you should check periodically to reduce the breakdown rate? Then you could write, but they don't know how to maintain it. So a lot of things can be done which can maintain, reduce the cost of maintaining things. And people can learn from each other. What's wrong with that? Home gardening. You know, how do you grow vegetables in your own a window? That's it. You don't need too much space. Home gardening should become a way of life in urban areas now. Uh, since uh, Kirut Satya has launched, now we also have for fishermen, for teachers, and one is launching for mothers. So similarly, or just like this, but again, Chetna thing, Chetna thing can come out. Every every pregnant lady can register, and then she should get messages at a periodic level. You can actually enter the trimester of the person who is expecting the mother. Huh? And then according to trimester, all the messages will come. Automatically, will go. I think that's. So I think that can be indicated. There is no cost. No cost indicated. No cost indicated. Sir, actually, we have a program in solar. Where every pregnant uh, mother that comes to the local Anganwadi worker, uh, from the CHC there is a message every day that goes on, you know, from way to SMS dot from mother without involving any other person. The diet that she can take for the next four months, every day she is given low cost diet that can help her have for addition. Uh, 
Laser application, even less labor pains, child and mother nutrition, health, mm -hmm. all these things, are, and also monitor her on a day to day basis. So, so SMS existing? Existing way to sms.com. Jobi. But then we will have limitation characters and stuff. Hey, but still, it is like you can send two messages 140, 140. You see, you need not send per day more than 280 words. Now, what a question mark, question answer? Sir, because they are monitored on a weekly basis. Okay. And then, sir, like, one girl may two pregnant mothers so sir. Ah, maximum ah. three more sir. They are monitored. Actually, sir, the main problem <coughs> in uh, the child and mother nutrition is in the government. After the teachers, the largest source of government employees are Anganwadi workers. Sir, we have say for example, per taluka 500 Anganwadi workers with a helper with a budget of 7,000 rupees per worker and helper which is 5,000 into 7,000 rupees, which is more than the cost of the nutrition. So, if you look at a macroeconomic level perspective, you are spending more on than delivery. to sell. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, you are, and you see common people are at such an ignorant level, to wash hands with soap, we are conducting exercises, to eat nagli or ragi, or you know, to do breastfeed, we are spending more than we are getting. We are not getting anything, we are spending more to deliver than to deliver the substance itself. Mm -hmm. So this is a policy challenge. Okay. Wonderful, thank you so much. Sir, sir, 